God bless you, precious folks. It is such a treat for us to get to be here. Uh, one of our lawyers, uh, Michael Adams, is here. One of our paralegals, Seth Hodd, is here. Tremendous, tremendous men of God and very talented people. Uh, I have a staff that I do not deserve. They're sent by God. And boy, are they ever good. And uh, they've been educated so much superior to how I ever was. Now, I always remind them uh, that their education exceeds mine, but they haven't stood in courtrooms and been nervous nearly as many times as I've done that. And so experience counts for something. And thank you for the great warmth you've shown to the Christian Law Association. And please don't take this church for granted. Yeah. What you have here is of God. Right. And the minute you think this is of you, God will give you back to you. And you'll want God back in a Texas second. Yeah. So praise the Lord. The music has been great. What a thrill to get to see friends here and Brother Bible, I always love getting to see you again and the precious folks here. Thank you for your warmth and your kindness. And I have never been encouraged to a food that I like better than that chocolate milkshake example. Wait till I call my wife and said, the preacher said that I should have chocolate milkshakes because that's what he compares me to. <laughs> now, my wife isn't going to buy it, but I'm going to try it, okay? Turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. This is a story from scripture that we teach to kids in Sunday school, and you know the story. But rarely do we tell the full feature of the story. It's the story of Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. And at verse 25, God divinely delivers them at midnight. I mean, God did a midnight miracle for Paul and Silas. And the reason I love to preach from this passage is because everybody in this room at some point is going to need a midnight miracle. You're going to need God to do something that only God can do. I don't know if it's in a relationship. I don't know if it's in health. I don't know if it's finances. I don't know. But everybody has things come at them in life and you say, I got to have God handle this. This is beyond anything I can handle as a man or a lady or as a teenager. And what about this midnight miracle? Now, indeed, God did do a midnight miracle. And we're going to study that miracle in just a minute. But I want to show you the four things that led up to that miracle. God tells us exactly what Paul and Silas did where God could do that midnight miracle. And he doesn't tell us just to fill in a page on the Bible. Every word here is for our instruction, for our correction, so that we can be reproved in righteousness. And God says, what I want you to do is study and look at this. Now, we're going to start reading, if you would, in chapter 16 at verse 6. And I want to tell you the first thing that, that Paul and Silas did. Paul and Silas had made a decision of what they wanted to do for God. They were going to leave and do a wonderful thing as two missionaries. They were going to go to Asia. And that's where they went to go. And God stopped them. And God said, no, I don't want you to go to Asia. But Lord, that's where we're headed. And God said, no, I want to turn you around and send you in a totally different direction. And here's my question for you before we read this. Are you willing to let God send you in a direction different than you have right now? Or would you say, no, 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 God. I got things pretty well buttoned down here. I'm near my kids. I'm near, and, and God, the, the, would you be willing to tell the Lord, I belong to you. I don't belong to me. You've been bought with a price. Would you be willing to tell God, you send me where you want me to go? Let's read the story. Verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now that's where they were headed. They were making their way there. And the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 I don't want you to go there. And they were come to Mysia and essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not 
You understand? They started in two directions and God stopped each one and said, no, no, not there. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. I love this vision. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, come, come over unto Macedonia and help us. Here's the first key. If you want God's midnight power, if you want God to be the God that you see in scripture, you got to be willing to be where he wants you to be. You got to be willing to go where he wants you to go. Yeah, but now wait a minute, Brother Gibbs. What if God wants to send me to some God-forbidden place? I mean, I'm not interested. That, that's, and then you wonder why the midnight miracle power isn't there. God says, you don't belong to you. David Gibbs doesn't belong to David Gibbs. You belong to the Lord. And do you trust him enough to say, Lord, I'm yours. Send me where you want me to go. Well, Brother Gibbs, here's what I'd rather do. I'd rather say, Lord, how about just tipping your hand a little bit and show me what you're thinking, and I'll let you know if I'm interested. God's never going to do that. God's looking for me to submit. He's looking for you to submit. I was in a church in Pennsylvania. It's a Sunday night. And in the altar call, a young couple came forward. And boy, that church got excited. Oh, my goodness. Ladies started crying. Some of them were waving little white hankies. Men were all excited. And I turned to the pastor and I said, Boy, your church is excited over this couple coming forward. He said, yeah. I said, are they in some kind of sin and they're repenting? He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, this is one of the finest couples in our church. I said, well, why is everybody so excited? He said, Brother Gibbs, tonight, they just told God, send me where you want me to go. He said, let me tell you their story. He's a medical doctor and has just completed a 14-year residency in intracranial reconstructive surgery. Now get this right. Four years of college, four years of med school, then 14 years of training to get certified for this specialty. Of those who start to get certified, less than 5% ever get it. He just graduated at the top of his class from one of the Ivy League's premier medical schools. You can't believe the people who want him. Every major medical facility in the company is saying, come, 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 we'll pay you. He said they're offering him $5 million to sign his name. One of the contracts he showed me said, we'll give you $5 million We'll give you a house in our community up to $2 million, and we'll buy you and your wife brand new cars every year up to $100,000 per car. Just sign your name. Brother Gibbs, he just walked forward to go to the mission field. He's not going to be in some palatial medical suite. He's going to be in dirt floors in Brazil. And tonight he just came forward to tell God, here I am, send me. Now while I'm standing there, two men came up and said, Brother Gibbs, will you please talk some sense into his head? With the money he can earn as this specialty in America, he can send missionaries by the dozens, talk some sense into his head. And I said, here's the problem, guys. He doesn't belong to you, and he sure don't belong to me. He belongs to the Lord. Right. And the question is not where he should go. The question is where does God want him to go? Yeah. Whoa. If you had all that training, if you had all that expertise, if you had those documents laying in front of you, and he had a dozen of them, 
We just say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Or we just say, no, I'm going to check the box for the good life. I'll be able to stay in America, have a wonderful time, be a part of a great church, be able to support and do wonderful things with the money. God doesn't want your money. He wants you. Now, when he gets you, he'll get your money. I walked down to hug this young man's neck. And he said, Brother Gibbs, it's been a war. He said, something just kept fighting. I kept thinking, but these positions. He said, look at the one here on the West Coast. They said, if this isn't enough, tell us what is enough. But he said, tonight, the Lord said, I'm enough. Is that you? Is that me? Don't sit here and ever sing, I surrender all. If you're not willing to surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. I surrender all. Would you be willing to say to God, wherever you want me to go, I'm yours. Well, Brother Gibbs, you think God's going to send me somewhere? I don't know. Here's what I know. He's got some place he wants you. Now, maybe it's right here. Maybe it's in some foreign nation. Maybe it's somewhere else in America. I don't know. The question is, are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to tell the Lord, I'm yours? Uh, Jesus, let me explain to you. Uh, that's not going to fly. No, no, no. Uh, some idea that I'll let you send me wherever you want me to go. No, no, no. But I want your help, and I want you to prosper me, and I want you to help me, and I want you to protect me, and I want you to answer my prayers. But some notion that I'll yield to you sending me, it's not going to happen. And then we wonder why our prayers have no power. Yeah. We wonder why how that peace that God promises isn't there. One of the things I've appreciated about my bride, uh, we just celebrated 56 years of marriage. One of the things I appreciate about her is she's always said, honey, I don't care where God sends us, as long as you're sure that's where we should go. Wherever God sends, we'll go. Now, I love what I get to do for the Lord. But I've had to go to the altar many times, especially recently, and say, God, because I love what I get to do for you, that doesn't mean you can't move me. I'm yours. I tell everybody, you want to go somewhere with God? It starts with you saying, Lord, I don't know where, but I'm yours. And I want to be where you want me to be. Can't you see Paul and Silas in jail? Things have not turned out well. They've been mercilessly beaten. Now they're in stocks in jail and at midnight. And can't you hear somebody saying, Paul, how'd you ever get in this mess? And I can hear Paul say, well, we had no intention of even coming here. We were on our way to Asia. And then we were on our way to Bithynia. And both times God says, uh-uh, that's not where I want you. God sent us here. That's why we're here. Are you going to be able to say, with a heaven sent amen, I am where God sent us, and I'm willing to go where else, but I want it here. Kids are God's little spies. How many of you are aware of that? How are you ever going to teach that child? You want to know what God's will is, no matter where God sends you, for what God sends you. You belong to him when mom and dad won't yield. When their mom and dad's got a plan all set up. But Brother Gibbs, I've worked on this a long time. I'm sure, so have I. But God says, I'm looking for someone to say, I surrender. I surrender. The last time I checked on that doctor, they said, you wouldn't believe the people that are coming to Christ. People in the Amazon are coming hundreds and hundreds of miles just so he can medically help them. 
and they're winning hundreds of people every week to Jesus. The last time I saw him, he said, I wouldn't trade where I'm at for any medical facility in the world because I know it's where God put me. Don't live your life second best. Don't you do it. But you got to be willing to surrender. Now, I believe with all my heart, your precious pastor and his dear wife and his family, who I love more than I can tell you, I just love these people. But they're not here by their choice. They're here by God's direction. This wasn't a career move. This was a God move. And God wants us to stay where whenever God wants us, here am I, send me. The first thing they did was yield to wherever God wanted them. Now, you don't need to read the rest of the story if you're going to yield on the location issue. And by the way, that's a faith trust issue. You can trust God. He wants what's best for you. He wants you to be where he wants you to be. But you've absolutely got to know, Lord, here am I. Wherever you want me to go, send me. Write the second key down. Number one, they were where God wanted them to be. Here's the second key. They were men of prayer. Look at verse 13. Here they are down in Philippi. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city. I love this next part. We went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spoke with women which resorted thither. Now, do you understand? Here's Paul and Silas, these incredible missionaries. And they went to people and said, where do people around here go to pray? And they said, oh, out by the riverside, there's a bunch of women that meet down there. And that's where they went. When's the last time you went out of your way to get with God's people to pray? Well, Brother Gibbs, I'm awful busy, aren't we all? When is the last time prayer mattered so much to you that you went to where people were want to have prayer made? That's what Paul and Silas did. Well, couldn't they just pray together? Sure they could. Couldn't they have just prayed alone? Sure they could. But they believed so much in the power of prayer that they said, we want to go gather ourselves with other people who believe in prayer. Dr. Johnny Pope, how many of you know Dr. Pope, John Pope, great man of God. He's in Houston, Texas. I'm down there preacher for him and he said, David, tomorrow morning we have a prayer meeting at 5 a.m. He said, we call it a live at five. And would you like to come? I said, you, you start at 5 a.m.? He said, yeah, yeah. Now I'm sitting here thinking, wait a minute. It'll take 30 minutes to get there. Now we're down to 4.30. It'll take me an hour to get showered and all cleaned up to go. Now we're backing around to 3.30. And here's what alive at five sounds to me like. Alive at five, dead at six. He said, Brother Gibbs, it'll be a great blessing for you to come and pray with these men. Do you understand what a privilege it is for God's people to get together to pray? Whoa. I thought, no, I ought to do it. I ought to do it. I love Brother Pope and... I love his people. It'll probably be him and me at 5 a.m. and three others or four others. I said, no, I'll be there. Well, he picked me up at 4.30. We made our way to the church. When we pulled in the church parking lot, I was floored. There weren't three or four cars. There were 150 cars. And I said, are these people all here for the prayer meeting? He said, these are all men who come for a live at 5. He said, David, you either believe in prayer or you don't. You either value prayer or you don't. You either think it's an incredible privilege to pray with God's people or you don't. And he said, these men started seeing God answer prayer. And he said, all of a sudden, they got excited about prayer. 
and we meet together and encourage each other to pray. Well, we walked in and boy, at five o'clock they started praying. My soul, when is the last time you went where prayer was want to be made? Now, can I tell you how to get you to a 5 a.m. prayer meeting? Uh, tomorrow morning we're going to go to prayer at 5 a.m. and I'll give everybody who shows up $10,000. You say, $10,000, how many people can I bring with me, Brother Gibbs? I'll bring all my kids, I'll bring my relatives, because you want the money. When's the last time you wanted God? When you wanted God, and you wanted to be with him. Whoa. I'm worried. I know wonderful Christians that have no problem watching Fox News for an hour, but they haven't prayed an hour in decades. I know wonderful people that'll go out of their way if there's a sale somewhere, but go out of their way to pray with God's people. Remember, whatever gets your time is what you value. Time is the one thing you can't replicate. And whatever gets your time says this is what you cherish. This is what you value. Wow. My one son came down very ill, deadly ill. An amazing thing happened. He was perfectly normal up to age 13. And suddenly, without explanation, his chest bone started growing in. And all of a sudden, his chest bone touched his spine. No one could explain why or how, but his front and back came together and were pushing on each other. All of his internal organs were spaced off, and our boy was dying. The best physicians we could find came to us and said, we need to do an experimental surgery. And I said, can you do this? And they said, we don't know. We've never done it before, but you only have a couple of days and your boy is dead. His heart's in severe failure. All his kidneys and everything are shutting down. He can't breathe. We want to try. I said, wow. I called the best doctor I knew. I grew up with him. Wonderful physician, been a friend for a long time. And I said, buddy, what would you do if you were me? He said, I'd find somebody who knows how to get a hold of God. You got to have God do something, David. When I hung up with buddy, I didn't call the best preacher I knew. I called the best prayer I knew. If I had to call somebody, could I call you? Oh, no, David. <laughs> on a zero to ten scale, being a good prayer, I'm a one, a two, maybe a three on a good day. What are we saying? Prayer is commanded by God. Prayer moves the arm of God, nothing more powerful than prayer. I called to get a hold of that pastor. And I got his church secretary and she said, oh, Brother Gibbs, I said, is he in? She said, no, he, he just left on a vacation trip. He won't be back for a week. She said, what do you need? I said, nothing, nothing. Please do not tell him I called. I don't want to disrupt this vacation. And I sat down and I thought, who am I going to call? Half an hour later, the phone rang and it was this preacher. He said, my office said you called. You wouldn't call if it wasn't something important. What's up? I said, I don't want to disturb your vacation. He said, no, no, no. What's up, David? And I told him about my boy and that I needed prayer. He said, David, I'm going to pull over and get a motel room. And I'm going to get on my face with God. And I'm going to prayer for you and your boy. 
Would that ever be you? Would that be me? That you could go move the arm of God by prayer. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. I said, preacher, I don't want to make you do that. He said, you're not making me do this. He said, this is a privilege for me, David. What a thrill to get to pray. My son's surgery took over 18 hours. When the doctor came out, he said, I don't know how to tell you this. We lost him several times. But somebody's praying. I called this preacher. He said, I've been on the floor for 18 hours praying with God. Is that you? Nah, I don't believe in prayer all that much, Brother Gibbs. Oh, I think I should pray a little. And, and by the way, when I pray mostly is when I'm terrified or scared. But the minute whatever is fear in me is gone, then I'm just off on my old self again. Oh, listen. I said, preacher, they said twice on the table, they lost him. He said, David, while I was praying there several times, he said, God impressed on my heart that things were dire. But I kept praying. Would anybody ever be able to count on you? Would they be able to count on me for somebody to fast and pray? And make a difference. Paul, what are you doing down here at the riverside? By the way, my son survived that surgery. Had to have two more after it. But every time we saw the doctors, they always said, whoever you had doing that, pray him. We'd like to hire him. Because in that room, it wasn't us. Something divine was going on. Whoa. Paul, what are you doing down here at the riverside? There's women down here who pray. And we so much believe in the power of prayer. And we so much believe in the privilege of prayer. Do you understand? You don't have a right to go to God. You get invited to come. And then we say to him, no, no, not, not today. I'm too busy. God says, you want the midnight miracle? Number one, you've got to be willing to go where I want you. Number two, you've got to be a man or a woman of prayer. I told this story to the group this afternoon. I was in a very impoverished country in Asia, very impoverished. And they held a large meeting. There were people there. No one there besides us had shoes. And what they were dressed in was rags. I mean, there's no one here who looks anything like they look. They have nothing. Well, during one of the breaks, two women walked up to me. And these two women had walked for three or four days just to get there. And they were thanking me for the messages. And one of the ladies looked at me and she said, In America, it must be hard for you to pray. I said, What do you mean? She said, Well, you have everything. I said, What? She said, You understand, we don't pray, we don't eat. We starve to death. We don't pray our kids die. There are no doctors. We don't pray marauders overrun our village and steal our children. Must be hard for you, you have everything. What would it take for us to understand? The truth is we have nothing if we don't have God. Nothing. But prayer changes everything. You want that midnight power, number one? You got to come where God wants you to be, wherever that is. Number two, you got to be a man or a woman of prayer. Write number three down. They're now in prison. They delivered a woman from a demon that was tormenting her. And boy, it made the people who were making money off of this woman mad. And so they took him, and look at what it says in verse 22. 
And the multitude rose up to gather against them. This is Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ran off their clothes and commissioned to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes on them, I mean, they beat them mercilessly. And by the way, in most of these beatings, they beat someone till their bones shone through their skin in the back. They would whip the skin and the muscle tissue off your bones. That was stripes. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. And having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, I love this, prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Now the first key is they were willing, going where God wanted them to be. The second key is they were men of prayer. And, boy, I, and I hope I'm wrong. My prayer life, I'm so convicted about my own. But I find not a lot of passion for prayer. And then we wonder why America's in the mess it's in. Prayer means everything. But now they've been beaten mercilessly. Their feet are in stocks. They're in the inner hold of the prison, which we're told was normally of something hewn out of stone. So I mean they're on the inside of the inside. And you know what they did at midnight? They prayed and sang praises. When's the last time you truly, from the depths of your heart, praised God? When, when you sang and praised God with all your might. Now remember, the Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people. You want to get God into something? Start praising him with all your heart. When is the last time you sang with such fervor that you got God in it? Well, Brother Gibbs, I, I'm just not much of a singer. And I'm no good at it. By the way, nowhere in the Bible does it say we're to be good at it. But it says we are to lift our voice in song. That's a command. And by the way, do you realize there's a lot of things we do here we're not going to do in heaven, but one we are going to do is sing praises. You're going to sing praises to God for all eternity. I wish you could sit on the platform and watch people sing. Most of the people look like they're in pain, <laughs> like they're in agony. Oh, Brother Nelson, he's not going to sing a third verse, is he? You know what I've discovered? You go to poor countries, when you're done singing, say, sing it again, sing it again. Because their whole heart is in it. The praise is in it. Whoa. If you never got to sing another song, within the next few minutes, you're going to pass away in the seat in which you're seated, sitting. Would you be able to say, that last song was something. I sang it with all my heart. You realize it's a sin to sing half-hearted to God. It's a sin. But boy, did I sing with all my might. I had the privilege to preach in an all-black church. I've had this privilege numerous times. They are great churches, wonderful people, gracious people. I love being with them. But here's a Sunday morning, and I walked in this church, and there was something unusual. There were several thousand people there. But I'm looking around, and I noticed I am the only person I can see here not of color. Normally, there's some other people not of color scattered around. I'm looking around, I don't see anybody not of color. And I'm going to preach there this morning. My guest said, sit right down over here on the front row. So I sat down. The people were warm. They were friendly. They came up. Some of them knew us. I don't know how, but we're shaking hands. Finally, a dear black lady came walking in. Precious lady. She walked over and she sat down on the front row, just a seat or two away from me. And I said to her, how are you doing? She said, I'm doing great. She said, how are you? I said, I'm great. Then she said something that startled me. No one had ever said this to me before. She said, what are you doing here, white boy? Come on. 
Now, never in my life had anybody called me white boy. And that just startled me. She didn't say it mean, but it startled me. She said, what are you doing here, white boy? I said, well, white boy's going to preach this morning. She said, no kidding. Boy, that's a hoot, isn't it? And I said, yeah, ma'am, that's a hoot. Yeah, I agree with you. White boy's going to preach. How about that? Then she looked at me and she said, you got the stuff, white boy? I said, I beg your pardon. She said, don't play stupid, white boy. You know exactly what I mean. The preacher's either got the stuff or he don't have the stuff. If the preacher don't have the stuff, we don't have church. You got the stuff, yes or no, white boy, which is it? I said, white boy's got the stuff. I didn't know what to say, okay? I mean, I'm sort of caught. She said, well, good. She said, now, did they tell you how we do church here? I said, no, not yet. Oh, she said, it's wonderful. She said, first thing we're going to do is we're going to sing for about an hour and a half. I said, an hour and a half? Oh, she said, it gets the devil so mad. She said, when God's people really sing praises from their heart, man, it just riles the devil up some. And she said, you can tell who's right with God because, man, they, they, they can't sing enough. But if they got sin in their life, boy, do they have trouble singing. She said, you love to sing, don't you, white boy? I said, I'm loving it more by the minute. Yeah, ma'am. <laughs> she said, then after that, we have testimonies. And people who got saved come forward and give a testimony. People confess sin. She said, last week, we had a fellow come forward, and he confessed he got saved, that he tried to blow the chief of police's car up with his family in it. He planted a bomb. And he came forward and repented. And the whole church took him down to the police station and turned him in. I said, you did what now? She said, he repented of his sin and we took him down to the chief of police and turned him in. She said, you haven't done any crimes, have you, white boy? <laughs> and I didn't say it out loud, but I thought it. None that I'm talking about this morning. Boy, I'll tell you, I'll be down at the Huska. <laughs> She said, then after that, we take the offering and we give to the Lord. And she said, then you get to preach. And she said, white boy, we didn't come here to get out. We come here to have church. So she said, whatever you do, and no one had ever said that. She said, don't make it short. I said, well, praise the Lord. She said, now I need you to do me a favor. I said, what's the favor? She said, I need you to move over. I said, move over. She said, yeah. Now, there's that much space between us. I said, somebody else coming? She said, no. I said, can I ask why you want me to move over? She said, sure. She said, when I get singing, I need my room. She said, when I really get praise in the Lord, she said, I need some space. Good thing I moved over. That lady started singing and tears just poured down her cheeks. Now the whole reason I told you this story is for this. After 10 minutes I said, Lord, I want that. I want that. Would anybody want the spirit you sing with? Would they even notice the spirit you sing? Boy, I found myself saying, God, that woman's like talking to you. Woo. Finally, the pastor called me up. Dear man of God. And he said, I see you sitting down there next to Sister Abby. I said, is that her name? He said, yeah. I said, preacher, I want to tell you something about her. I want her spirit when we sing. She sings like she means it. When's the last time you sang to God like you mean it? Whoa. He said, Brother Gibbs, did she share her testimony? I said, no. She said, Brother Gibbs, she has two teenage boys and a husband who a year ago they went down to catch a bus, her husband to work and the boys to school. 
at 5.30 in the morning. And a car pulled up full of thugs at 5.30 a.m. And shotguns came out and they killed their family for no reason. They murdered them. Then they got out and blew the heads off her kids. We don't know who did it. We haven't been able to find their heads yet. Brother Gibbs, when we had the funeral for those kids and her husband, she said, you gotta help me sing. I gotta have God. He is in the presence when you praise him. Whoa. He said, nothing's taken that. I thought to myself, Lord, forgive me for walking into church upset over what I can't even remember what and sing half-hearted, if hardly at all, and God says, I want you to understand. When you sing, it's worship. And when you sing half-hearted, that's half-hearted worship, which is a sin. The Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. That's the command. Mercy. I only got to see that lady one time after that, several months later. She walked up to me and she said, you okay, white boy? I said, white boy's doing just fine. I said, but my sister, I'm singing like I've never sung before because of you. Would anybody see you praise God and say, that's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I need. I've seen people get more excited about a baseball game or a football game than they've ever got excited about singing praise to God. And God says, stop it. I want you to be willing to go wherever I send you. And I want you to be a man or a woman of prayer. And when you're in the stocks and need a midnight miracle, I want you to pray and sing praises unto me. Some of the best singing I've ever heard has been in hospital rooms. Because boy, did we need God. What would it take to get you praising like that? There's one final thing. And look at verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaking. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison walking out, waking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing the prisoners had been fled. And Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Now, do you understand if I'd been in that prison and the guy who had me get whipped and then put me in stocks and left me in the inner prison, all of a sudden all the doors are open and he wants to commit suicide, let me help hold the sword for you. But that's not what he did. Look at what happened. And Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Number one. They were where God wanted them to be. They were willing to go where he said to go. Number two, they were men of prayer. Number three, they were men of praise. And they were men whose mission was to get people to Christ. What do I have to do to be saved? Listen, our backs are torn open. We've had a bad night. What must I do? Love the way he says it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. How passionate are you with the gospel? Now listen and we're done. My wife is a very timid, quiet, 
demure, very polite lady. You know my wife, Miss Betty. If, she, if, if you're in a room, she's not the one likely to speak up. She's just very gracious and timid. But she witnesses to everybody. I mean everybody. She'll say to people, I want you to understand, this is eternity we're talking about. And God saved my soul. It's a free gift. I'll never forget the night she got saved. We were at a Youth for Christ rally. We had 100 kids at this rally. She's sitting at the row in front of me. And I remember she turned to the girl next to her. And the man who was preaching that night, Florian Manis, said, it's a free gift. And she turned to the girl in front of me. She said, it's a free gift. I want that. I want to get saved. And before he gave the altar call, she's walking forward. And she said, it's a free gift for you too. Don't you want it? She's passionate about sharing the gospel. Paul and Silas, you've had a rough night. What are you doing with this guy and his family? We're getting them saved. Because that's their passion. What's your passion? How fervent are you about it? I love to tell the story of Brother Mark Smith, a pastor in Tacoma, Washington. A story of his precious wife. His wife was in Jacksonville, Florida, and she's dying. She only has a couple of weeks to live. Cancer has terribly attacked her body. She's bed bound. And she says to her son, I, I, I can't get out of bed to go witness to people. So here's what I want you to do. Would you please get a cheap phone, the cheapest you can get, only local calls, and get me a phone book? And they found one for $4 a month. And she said, all I want to do is call people out of the phone book and try to witness to them. And Pastor Smith said, Mom, I, I don't think that people will respond to that much. She said, but I got such a passion to share the gospel. These are my last days on the planet. And by the way, I don't know when your last days will be. But eventually, your opportunity to the witness will be over. He said, okay, we'll do it. Well, Betty Smith did a very unusual thing. She would open the phone book and pick a number at random. And she'd dial him, and when they answered, she said, you don't know me, and I don't know you. My name's Betty Smith, and I live here, and I'm dying. I only have a few days left before cancer takes my life. Would you please let me share something with you that matters more than anything to me? And cold call it. Nine out of ten people talk to her. In the last weeks of her life, she led over 300 people to Christ, 200 of whom came to the church and walked the aisle to be baptized. A lady with a passion. You know what I now know? If you have a passion, nothing will stop you. The reason we don't witness is we don't have the passion. What would it take for you to say, Lord, put me where you want me. Here I am. Send me. I trust you. You know what's best for me, for my family. Here am I. God, number two, I want to be a man and woman of prayer. I want to be with people. When people want to pray, I want to be down at that river's edge with those women and Paul and Silas. Number three, no matter what the circumstances are, they praise God. And never forget that dear black sister, how she praised the Lord through all that heartache, through all that grief. But she sang with all her heart. When's the last time you sang with all your heart and you sang praise? Then lastly, they never lost their passion for souls. 
Man, every door is open. All the bands are loose. Hey, guys, we are out of here. Let's go. No, no, no. The jailer's about to commit suicide, and Paul and Silas say, no, 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 don't do that. We want to reach you with the gospel. And they did. The midnight power of God. Why do you think all those people responded to Betty Smith? Because she asked God to use her. And she'd tell people, if you want to hang up on me, I wouldn't blame you. But please give me just a minute of your time. It's all I have left. And people responded to that. So much so that a local newspaper came out and said, everybody's talking about the lady who can't get out of bed, who's winning the whole city. How are you doing it, Mrs. Smith? She said, I'm not, God is. You got to be where God wants you to be. You got to be a man or woman of prayer. You got to sing his praises with all your heart. Remember, it's a sin to praise God half-hearted. It's a sin. And boy, then number four, you've got to have a passion for souls. Paul, what are you doing, you and Silas? Oh, I'm winning this jailkeeper to the Lord and his house. Wow. You ready for the midnight miracle? God tells you all these parts of the story for a reason. He plays no favorites. What he did for Paul and Silas, he'll do for you. Here am I. Wherever you want me, Lord, I'm yours. God, I want to be a man of prayer. Not, not just say I believe it. I want to be a man of prayer, a woman of prayer. I doubt if there's anybody here that would say, I don't believe in prayer. We just don't pray. I want to be a man or woman of prayer. And then by God's grace, I want to sing his praises with all my heart. And by his grace, I want to get a passion for reaching others. I can't wait till we get to heaven. I want to talk to the jailer. You were the guy that was there when God shook the bars open, when God dropped all the bands, all the prisoners. And you know what it says? God loosed every one of the prisoners and none of them left. When God gets in it, God does it his way. I'm begging you tonight for the sake of our nation, for the sake of our Savior. Lord, here am I, wherever you want me, wherever, I'm yours. Yeah, but the brother gives my career. No, no, wherever you want me, Lord, I'm yours. I don't belong to me. Number two, a man or woman of prayer. I get so busy, so overwhelmed. I, I mean, this afternoon when I went back to the room, my goodness, there's all these calls and emails stacked up that I got to take care of. I, I just get overwhelmed. And all of a sudden, God, I said I've got time to pray. Prayer is priority one. Without prayer, we're going nowhere. You're going nowhere. Whatever you value gets your time. And I'll never forget Johnny Pope. When we walked out of there at 6 a.m. in the morning, I said, next time I'm here, I want to go to a live at 5 with you. Those men prayed with such fervor. Whoa. And then you got to sing his praises. Uh, maybe your voice is like mine, not great. There's one thing I can tell you. He doesn't make you sing good. He just makes you sing loud. He wants you to be fervent. I hope you got voices like the McCurdy's have. I love their singing. But not many of us do. But we can sing with passion. And then lastly, there's somebody who needs a track from me tonight. There's somebody who needs a track from you tomorrow morning. I don't know where or who. I just know they're everywhere. That track rack out there should be cleaned out. Every service. Because there's people who need what's on those tracks. Can't you see it when we get to heaven? Paul and Silas, you were there when God broke it all open? Sure did. That was some day, huh? Yeah, it sure was. But it didn't start in prison. It started with us being where God wanted us. 
We were headed in two opposite directions. And God said, "Uh uh-uh. We weren't going to do anything bad. We were missionaries. God said, I want you here. So down to Philippi they went, to Galatia. And then, man, we found these women praying, and, man, we got with them. Prayer is a matter of high priority. And then we sang praises. Our backs were torn open. We can't move. And by the way, we sang so loud, everybody in the prison heard us. That's what the scripture says. We didn't sing under our breath. We sang so everybody could hear us. Praise God. And then we had the privilege to witness. Tonight, I promise you, we need the midnight power. Bow your heads in prayer. Father, forgive us. Forgive me. We've been so lax on these points. Help us. Heads are bowed. How many of you say, David, God spoke to my heart tonight. I want that midnight miracle power by God's grace. It starts with me telling God, wherever you want me, God, I'm yours. It starts with me getting a new passion for prayer. Nothing can take the place of prayer. Nothing more valuable than prayer. And by God's grace, I got to sing his praises with all my heart and have a passion for souls. David, my heart's been touched tonight. If that's true, hold your hand up right now. Hold your hand high. Hold it way up. Father, you see the hands. If you raised your hand, I want you to get up out of your seat. We're going to close in prayer at this altar. You come forward right now. I didn't raise my hand, but I should have. You come too. Paul and Silas. Philippian jailer. Brother Gibbs, what if God wants me to go? I don't know where. You can trust him. He loves you. He knows what's best for you. But you got to be willing to yield. Father, I bow with them tonight. Forgive me for my prayer life. It's been so snuffed out by busyness. God, we want to be where you want us, and we want to be men and women of prayer. What a thrill that we get to pray to you. And when we pray, the very Son of God makes intercession for us in front of the Father. How would we ever not be passionate about that? And God, forgive us for praising you half-hearted. By your grace, we want to be a people who sing with all our might. You're worthy of praise. And God, don't let us forget every man, every woman, every child we ever meet has an appointment with eternity we can share the good news with them. Thank you for speaking to hearts. Now God, as these people leave tonight, if they forget everything I've said, that's of no consequence. May we never forget what the book of Acts says, the story of Paul and Silas in a midnight miracle. Hear our cry in Jesus' name. Amen.